Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us for the third installment of our Small Business Recovery Tour. Today's stop is Miami. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Wells Fargo, for its timely, for making this timely event series possible. Facing a once-in-a-generation pandemic, small business owners have had to meet challenge after challenge with resilience and innovation. As the economic effects of COVID-19 continue to be felt across the country, what must be done to ensure an inclusive recovery, one that allows all business owners in all communities to really thrive. The majority Hispanic city of Miami is dealing, still dealing with the devastating impacts of the pandemic and recently endured the Surfside tragedy. What will it take to assist small business owners in these communities most affected and what unique assistance do diverse small business owners urgently need? We have a fantastic lineup of speakers to answer these questions and more, but before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill events using the hashtag the Hill Small Biz, B-I-Z. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page and we're told that will fix everything for you. My first guest of the hour is my friend, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Her district includes Surfside, the area that was tragically affected by the recent condominium collapse and where many small business owners are in need of help. Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz has been working to assist small business owners in her own district and spread awareness of available American Rescue Plan funds even more widely. Um, Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us today. Look, I think one of the things I'm trying to kind of get into is I sort of felt there was this period of time where it looked like we were coming out of the dark side of COVID and getting to the other side. Now that's a wobbly prospect. I'd like to hear from you and your constituents as you talk to them. What are they feeling? What are small businesses that went through such trauma feeling now? First of all, Steve, welcome virtually the, to South Florida. The Congresswoman Florida. is muted, and folks. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. Um, folks, you're you're right. At the end of the spring, you know, you could feel it, you could taste it. People were re-emerging here in South Florida. Uh, but then the Delta variant came surging through our state, surging across the country. And really, in the past year, small businesses have fought relentlessly to stay afloat. They've had unprecedented challenges. And, and just like most of the country, small businesses here are the glue that holds our communities together. And really, it was through no fault of their own. The small business community across Florida was devastated during the pandemic, and they are still being dramatically impacted. We had nearly 75 percent of small, small businesses in, in Florida either voluntarily shut down or were forced to shut down, understandably so, during the pandemic. And South Florida, and Miami in particular, which has a heavy reliance on tourism, was devastated by those shutdowns and stay-at-home orders. We had in Florida International University studies that say that when you account for the direct and indirect effects of the pandemic. Miami-Dade County hotels and restaurants suffered more than $3 billion in losses in 2020. And we're still seeing businesses struggle to dig out of that hole. But thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we had a one, that was a $1.7 trillion bill that included $50 billion in funding for American small businesses. And we've been able to, and I know I held webinars all the way through the pandemic, and I'm still holding them, helping constituents understand how to apply for those important loans and grants. You know, you had $28.6 billion in that plan for the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. That was targeted aid that was absolutely critical. The rest of, restaurant industry was desperate for that funding, and it was grant funding, thankfully. And, and look, the ARP was built on really the, the, the idea that the $2.2 trillion CARES Act stimulus bill, and that established the Paycheck Protection Program but, and the EDL program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. But it was crucial that we get more resources and really infuse it into the economy. The bottom line, though, just to wrap up, is that we have to get a handle on this virus and we have to make sure more people are vaccinated and we have to make sure that we still engage in those all important social distancing and mask wearing and public health guidelines. Financing, getting them the funds to have supported them through this terrible time. Another, another part of it is 
you know, incredible stories of resilience, of innovation. I've seen a lot of shop owners, um, even restaurants that found, you know, a pathway with digital tools and then kind of partnering up with the support that the government and communities came together. I'd just be interested, you know, if any of these really stand out among your constituents, you know, of, the, of, these, of these fascinating stories where people were able to, to turn on a dime and, 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 and survive, even with, you know, I mean, there was support there, but they've changed their business for the better as they look forward, you know, uh, moving forward? No, no question. I mean, we've seen, we've seen businesses, Steve, who, you know, instead of their, their freestanding storefront, they, you know, loaded their business onto a truck, uh, particularly restaurants. You saw a lot more of that type of circulation. You saw pop-ups. You saw entire businesses shift their operations outdoors. You saw municipalities, in some cases in South Florida, you know, some of our suburban municipalities don't allow a lot of outdoor seating for restaurants, and yet they closed in, in, Miami, in Miami Beach. They, they closed, you know, long stretches of Collins Avenue and let people put, you know, let those businesses put that seating out there. So it was an all hands on deck, everybody pulled together. And frankly, when Surfside happened, that's, uh, th that's another opportunity where this community came together, not just folks who lived in Surfside, which only has about 5,600 people, um, but our whole community pulled together because those businesses in that small town were really devastated and making sure that we could provide them with the information they needed to get access to those loans and grants. And also, I just urge everyone, stop by uh, the, the, the main drag in Surfside and uh, patronize a business in Surfside because they really need your help. You know, uh, and, and are you seeing people show up in Surfside to show their support for that community that was impacted? Do you see a blip up? We are. It's slowly starting to come back, but you know there's still challenges with the building, you know, and the access to Collins Avenue while they're trying to get fencing around the, the site, and there's also de 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 decontamination issues that are still are still there. So it's it's still a bit of a struggle, but the, the, they're working very hard. And so as much as we can, continue to try to patronize those businesses and get them access to those resources. And thankfully, President Biden, you know, left into action and was able to get a disaster declaration made so that, you know, under a normal normal circumstance, when you have a disaster like this of a private structure, you, which, you know, we haven't had with a residential structure in, in modern times, you know, the, the FEMA is is usually not getting involved in, in declaring a disaster. But thankfully, President Biden um, and his administration recognized how unique and critical it was to do that here. One of the other things that's happened, unfortunately, in this country, and it's, you know, kind of a function of the toxicity of these times, I guess, is, is on one hand, um, American citizens and business owners are getting certain uh, kinds of mask guidance from the White House and the Centers for Disease Control, um, and they're hearing different things from some governors around the country, including the governor of Florida. How do, how are your constituents navigating this? How do small business owners um, feel getting orders one way and then, and then being pushed another? Yeah, unfortunately, our governor has been really one of the main obstacles to stopping the spread of the, the coronavirus here in, in Florida. Um, he's put obstacle after obstacle in the way uh, spread mis misinformation, prohibiting masks from being required in our schools, you know, threatening, uh, actually beginning to withhold funding from our school districts. Yesterday, he threatened to fine uh, local governments for requiring their employees to, uh, to get vaccinated when we know that vaccination is the clearest way to make sure that we can stop the spread of COVID. And we've had among the highest rates of COVID in the country with this, with this resurgence of the Delta variant. And it's incredibly confusing, but also grossly irresponsible. The CDC has had adaptive guidelines because this is a unique and novel virus that has never been seen before. So of course their guidance is gonna be needed to be updated. But if you, and I just did an Ask the Doctors segment, segment with my public health uh, experts that I've been talking with publicly throughout the pandemic, they specifically mentioned that even if you're vaccinated, because the Delta variant is so infectious, wearing a mask, it's like wearing suspenders and 
and a belt. It's like, you know, when you are asked to wear your seatbelt on an airplane, but then you can take it off. This is the analogy they used when it's not so turbulent. Um, but when turbulence happens, then you put the seatbelt back on. That's why there's a necessity, even if you're vaccinated, to wear a mask. You're keeping yourself safe. You're keeping others safe. And we have to make sure that businesses, that, that these business owners, they're smart. They are the ones that made their business success, successful. We have to let them make the decisions that they know are best for their small business and its, and its ability to thrive. Let me just ask you, uh, finally, Congresswoman, you know, one of the big debates in Washington right now, which I think the country is paying attention to, is this difference on the, you know, tax and reconciliation package and the infrastructure package, sort of a three and a half trillion dollar price tag, you know, versus some in the Democratic caucus that are maybe at a, you know, one and a half trillion dollar. I'm just interested in what you think the equities are that need to be preserved in that in that battle within the I mean that's just talking within the Democrats what do you think is key what do you think is important what do you think is overdone well certainly making the child tax credit permanent so that we can continue to ensure that we cut that child poverty rate in half and make sure that about the about three to three hundred and fifty dollars a month is continues to families who absolutely desperately need it these are the working poor who need those funds to be able to climb out. And, and those are the folks that, that we need to make sure these small businesses have the ability to hire. Hmm. Uh, making sure that community college, the first two years of community college, so that we can have more people climb that ladder to the middle class. Uh, th those, are, those are two critical things that I think are important. Um, look, it's hard to know where you're going to cut, but we know that the legislative process is about compromise. The bottom line is that we have an opportunity for a transformative, historic infusion of resources, both in our hard infrastructure as well as the soft infrastructure, which is our, which are, which are our human beings across the country, whose quality of life we have an opportunity to improve now, and we must pull pull together as a country in a bipartisan way to get this done. Well, thank you. Well, we will leave it there. Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, she's Chief Deputy Whip of the Democratic Caucus, and so many other things. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.